Hi, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Janet Hancock, and I work at the Public Record Office. And just on behalf of Prony, I just wanted to welcome you all and thank you all for coming. Um, please feel free to say hi on the chat and let us know where you're joining us from. Um, so you've all been, uh, we're recording this session, so if you don't want to appear, you can just switch your camera off. Um, and equally, you've all been muted, and that's just to keep background noise down. Uh, but if you have any questions, uh, if you want to drop them into the chat function, uh, we'll, we'll try and get to some of them if we have time at the end of the talk. So this was one of a four-part series, today's talk on the world of the street directory. Um, and we've actually got, this is the last of the four, but we're actually rerunning our first, which was around the census, and that will be next Tuesday, and will coincide with, with census date on the 21st here as well. So uh, if you missed it first time round, please do, do come along to that. Um, so Des is going to talk to you uh, about street directories for about 45 minutes, and then we're going to play a little uh, VT, which is a little bit of a how-to on how to use the street directories application on uh, the Pony website, and uh, we'll take some questions after that. So I'm going to pass you across to Des to get started. Okay, um, I'll, I'll start talking. Okay, I'm, just, I'm going to start this too, so I can see what I'm doing. Okay, um, sometimes affectionately known as books, which are not books. That's what Charles Lamb calls them. And he meant books which are made up of, ta of, of uh, tables and lists rather than um, argued text or imaginative text. The trade and street directories of the 18th, 19th and 20th centuries grew out of handy tradesmen's lists produced by commercial registry offices set up in certain of the bigger trading centres in Britain and Ireland from the 1680s, grafted onto the wildly popular prognostical almanacs sold in town and country from the 1600s. In different ways, they listed names, addresses and occupations in cities, towns and even villages. By the 1850s, there was no office, ordinary working office anywhere without its own set of bulky directories for daily consultation. Although they died out in Ireland by about 2005, Genealogists and researchers remain indebted to directories as encyclopedic sources of personal and social information on urban life between 1750 and the 1970s. At their most basic, directories were simple lists of names and addresses. The more evolved directories opened up such lists by means of varieties of format, and they recreated the urban setting in such detail that were unable to make sense of lives, the lives of our ancestors. Because people moved around the British Isles continually in the industrial age, Scottish, English and Welsh directories are also important resources for the Irish genealogist. Now, the almanac, in the form of a single sheet or a few crudely printed pages, was one of the curiosities of fair and market from the late 1500s. This was an English, a big English fair, Whitcomb Fair. These cheap booklets originated as annual sets of ephemerides for casting horoscopes. Essentially, they were astrological to begin with. The astrological solemnities were soon accompanied by calendars, advice on times of sowing, pruning and harvest, tidal charts, eclipses and phases of the moon, and doggerel sayings and verses. They were rural in character and purpose, although they were enjoyed by everyone. Directories belonged to a different commercial world. That's a zodiacal medicine almanac, a typical almanac thing. And there's a peddler just traveling outside fairs and selling these things. They also hawk them at fairs. Now the directories belong to this kind of world. Till the 1740s, internal trade in England and in Ireland was carried on in a face-to-face -face society at the great seasonal fairs like Whitcomb Fair where merchants visited to deal with craftsmen and people selling. By the later 18th century, the complexity of consumer demand and industrial manufacture meant that wholesalers and industrialists relied more on the coordination of numerous and diverse specialist craftsmen and others managed through the activity of delegated commercial agents or travelers moving inside an impersonal network of contacts and competitors. Directories, which means books giving directions to outsiders, first appeared in the large and larger urban harbors and ports where arrangements to guided arrangements to import and export goods in quantity were carried out by agents and factors. Registry offices 
guided visitors as to the whereabouts of merchants, the arrivals and departures of ships, the current price of certain commodities. That's a quote from the very first trade directory. In London in 1677, Samuel Lee, a licensed stationer, published a list of the names and addresses of 2,000 city merchants and goldsmiths involved heavily in the international wholesale trade. Quote, for the benefit of all dealers that shall have occasion with any of them. So it's to make a contact between outsiders and people in the, in the city. There was virtually no successor in England until 1734, when, uh, and this is London in the early 1700s, uh, a massive port and the kind of life in, in, in the time. And there was no, no competitor um, until 1734 when Henry Kent, a publisher, brought out a list of 1,200 active London merchants compiled by James Brown, the first of a yearly listing titled Directory of the Cities of London and Westminster. Started 1734, brought out every year after that. Now, this was little more than an alphabetical list of merchants and substantial tradesmen, but it formed the model for certain similar directories for another century. Revised editions were published annually till the death of Kent in 1771, when the copyrighted name was sold for use by other publishers. Meanwhile, the different Irish and British almanacs had begun to furnish details of the times of fairs and markets and to provide lists of those in key parts of municipal government. So they started taking stuff that was actually in the almanacs. Now, the next directory made in the British Isles was prepared for Dublin in 1751. Dublin was perhaps the, um, the second city of international trade. The almanacs continued and they developed, became more sophisticated. There were special ladies' almanacs released at that stage. So they turned, they, they changed their form. Anyway, here's a list of the directories published in England and Wales and in Ireland in between 1734 and 1800. Very few, really. There's only about 13 there. I think, I think that's about it. Or, well, no, maybe there's about 17. But uh, you can see very, very few in the early 18th century. They're nearly all ports. I've highlighted in red the Irish ones. So just about four Irish ones uh, and hardly any other ones. So they were quite unusual. And here's a couple of examples. It's a Birmingham directory. Um, and again, they added um, the times and the prices of carriers from uh, Birmingham to other places. So somebody would come to Birmingham, they'd make an arrangement with the craftsman, and then they'd have to figure out if they wanted to send stuff to Shrewsbury or something, was there somebody going to Shrewsbury and how much it would cost? So um, then you get, uh, there's particular directories for particular cities, and then you get general regional directories like Bailey's Northern Directory, the very first one, which came out in 1781. And you can see a very basic uh, this included London, and then it also included a number of other principal towns, mainly northern England. And you can see from the page on the London directory, there's uh, Quinton Dick, an Irish factor living in King Street. And then at the bottom, there's P&A Donnellan, Irish factors living in Wood Street. This is the 1780s. There were probably textile factors, and they were mediating between trade in Ireland and trade in London. And you do get that, and you certainly get it. They'll come from, um, there will be a number of them from Ulster in this. Now, most of these directories were published in revised form, regularly and irregularly, for a number of years after these dates, the dates in the table. They supported business engagement, and they also began to create their own market over time. Booksellers, printers, stationers, and opportunists saw chances of easy fortune in publishing these new texts, but usually found the commercial realities more treacherous. People liked using directories, uh, and they complained of errors of compilation, but they were unreliable customers. Making a competent directory was also an arduous matter. You had to do it properly. It looked simple, but if you made a mess of it, then you just got a bad reputation immediately. Although most of the British late 18th century directors, directories represented a limited number of towns and cities in England and Scotland, the larger Irish merchant families uh, all over Ireland had connections and relatives in London, the Midlands and Scotland. And researchers need to bear these resources in mind. I remember coming across in Thomas de Quincey's autobiography, he mentions um, meeting, uh, his, his father was a big linen merchant, and he remembers meeting big Irish linen merchants uh, in Manchester, uh, working nearly all the time in Manchester, and agents too. From the 1820s, now one of the big things was 
around about 1815, there was a massive change in printing presses. It could produce, this printing press could produce 2,000 pages an hour. It made it much cheaper and faster to produce stuff. So they began to get bigger. From the 1820s, directories of all kinds proliferated all over Britain. The number of directories peaked in the 1930s when some 400 directories were annually published. Now, the first Irish almanacs and directories. We go back to the fairs again, country fairs. Almanac Des, you've got on to mute. Okay, okay, that's strange. Um, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, I don't know what happened there. Uh, published in Dublin till the 1720s by a series of ambitious, idiosyncratic astrologers and truant teachers. The first known was by William Farmer in 1787. Um, and that's a kind of a typical zodiacal man. And they were all in, in English. Although there was an experiment with an Irish language um, almanac in the early 1720s, which is very, very interesting. Um, Protestant and Catholic political bias often showed through their interpretation of astro astrological conjunctions. So the same conjunction would portend different things for the Protestants and the Catholics. Ambrose White, one of the more temperate authors, provided in 1665 and onwards full guides to the roads and fairs of Ireland. So they had zodiacal stuff, they had ag agricultural stuff, and then they began to bring in quite a lot of general information. Ultimately, by the 18th century, very important for genealogists and researchers. By 1685, John Burke's Hibernia Merlinus had added useful tables of money for buyers and sellers in the country. Uh, this is Hibernia Merlinus, and he mentions there, you can see the sort of stuff, constitutions of the air, the rising and setting of the sun, the tides, the terms and their returns. That's the law terms. They're bringing in uh, legal stuff with tables of money, latitude and longitude, or just latitude then, exact chronology of all the kings of Ireland with the remarkable things done by them from the time of St. Patrick, highways, fairs and markets. The sort of stuff that people needed who were traveling around the country and a nice little verse for the farmer. What to do in February. And then <clears throat> the inimitable wild men of the Irish Astrological uh, Almanac, John Worley, Andrew Comstey, John Coates and Peter Laboisier, uh, entertained readers with vendettas, satirical reports, ominous forecasts uh, and commercial odds and ends between 1686 and the 1720s. In 1712, it was reported that a servant had run away from a Dublin house carrying an almanac book with a rich gold cover in which are some remarks in writing concerning forest trees. They always had blank pages that people could fill in their notes. From about this date, Coates offered readers lists of Dublin aldermen, sheriffs and mayors. Jonathan Swift made lethal parodies of their writings and lampooned their personalities, meaning to eradicate belief in astrology, pagan thing. Through his influence, the foundational 18th century Irish almanac, the Gentleman and Citizens Almanac, this is Theophilus Moore, Old Moore's Almanac, goes back to the 1750s. This is a modernized woodcut, and the woodcut was in the first thing. He looks like a wise old astrologer. I like Old Moore's Almanac, and I still buy it just to enjoy it. But the first rational almanac in Ireland, the Gentleman's and Citizen's Almanac, came out in 1731, published by, by, civil, by John Watson. From, in, from the very beginning, Watson assembled lists of law officers, members of the Irish Lords and Commons, officers of customs and civil departments, members of official boards and charities, addresses of Dublin doctors, together with practical commercial tables of exchange, all this kind of stuff. Now, a certain kind of person is going to appear there. These were many of the same officials handling the business and legal affairs generated in Ulster, where the textile trade had begun to flourish. Textiles were flourishing in Ulster, but the institutional centre was in Dublin, where, of course, there's the Customs House. That's where stuff was imported. Belfast was quite a small town at the time. Dublin was also a big place for the printing of ephemera. There was no rules in Dublin, and they pirated books all over the place. So directories, almanacs were one more thing the Dublin printer could get into. Now, the first known almanac printed in Ulster was called Grant's Almanac, and it was a highly successful enterprise of Nicholas Grant of Newry, a schoolmaster and shopkeeper. We have an ad of his shop selling pots, griddles, ovens, and tea kettles. Lasting from 1750 till his death in 1783, when the almanac was taken over by his protege, John Misty of Newry. The first true Irish trade directory was published in Dublin in 1751. Now, there's the Watson's Almanac. That gives you a detailed rundown of the sort of stuff you'd expect to see. Quite detailed stuff. 
comes close to a directory, but it doesn't have lists of people in, in towns, but it gives you their offices. Newry, the second place in, Belf in, in Ulster at the time. Well, you've got Newry, Belfast and Derry, and it's a, it's a big place, it's a rogues map. This is where the almanacs were published. Dublin, though, was the second city in the kingdom, in the United Kingdom in uh, the late 18th century. 1751, Wilson produced the first Irish trade directory, a 16-page pamphlet in 250 copies, listing 800 of the most notable merchants and grocers in Dublin. There was a second edition in 1753. It listed 1,000 merchants and retailers, in addition to having tables of currency. Again, the tables of currency were because outsiders came in, they had foreign coins, and they needed to be able to exchange their coins. But the second one sold poorly. He abandoned the idea. And then in 1760, he was persuaded by various Quaker merchants to have another go. He enlarged the listing and the number of other lists of public use and threw in a, a new town plan of Dublin for visitors, tabling larger and smaller streets and having this town plan. Here's the advert for 1780, occupations and places of abode, anxious to make it as complete as possible. Some houses are not numbered. 1775 was when, uh, 1760s was when London houses were numbered, 1770s was when Dublin houses were numbered. Belfast houses weren't numbered at that stage. Once they're numbered, it makes it easier to assemble lists. Here's a typical list. You can see this is 1803, the same uh, annually produced Wilson's um, thing. And you can see you've got your names, alphabetical order, uh, a mix and gather of streets and the numbering. Here's the first plan of Dublin that was produced. And these are the first folding maps, um, you know, the handy folding maps that someone can just keep in their pocket. That's when it started with these directories. Now, from 1761, the directory was normally bound with the registry of John Exshaw. This was different from an almanac. It contained government, army, and navy lists. So if you get army and navy lists, if you are, say, a middle class or upper class, you're bound to have relations who are in the army or the navy. They can appear in these army and navy lists, and they're in the registry, Exshaw's registry. And he also added in, threw in Watson's Almanac, and it made a general volume known as the Treble Almanac. Very useful stuff. Published annually about five or 800 copies of them until 1834. There was a voluminous but short-lived city and country calendar in 1794 and 1795, but that was its only rival until the 1830s. Directories came late to the rest of Ireland, comparing poorly with industrial Britain. John Ferrer, um, poet, historian and printer, published a sophisticated 50-page limerick directory, you'll see it there in 1769, naming 500 merchants and traders. It's quite long and quite detailed. There's a lot of good stuff in it. And there's two, again, it's a port, People are bringing stuff in, import and export. And there's two Cork directories, 1787 and 1797, city directories. Otherwise, the only listings available were given by Richard Lucas in the General Directory of the Kingdom of Ireland. You can see it there on the table. So there's very few stuff up to 1820. You can see there's nothing for Ulster, essentially. There's just those almanacs starting in Uri in the 1750s, and then there's Belfast almanacs in the 1760s, 1770s. And you get a few directories then in the uh, early 1800s. Uh, so they're quite interesting. Now this is a, it's kind of ancillary to this. Traveling the roads of Ireland, you had a map of the roads of Ireland. This gives the, the list of gentlemen's seats. It's a beautiful series of things. Um, this is the front piece of the second edition. Now there, there, this is, in Ireland as a whole, um, there aren't that many directories. It's not comparable to England. I didn't list all the ordinary county directories, and I'm just mentioning Donald Begley gives a list of them in uh, the 1981 Irish genealogy book. Uh, it, there'd be too much to put it into, into a table, not a huge number. But these are the general directories from 1820 to 1900. You can see James Pickett. These produce, these give you listings for Belfast and Dublin, the big cities, and then a selection of the smaller towns and villages. So if your ancestor was a shopkeeper, a merchant of some kind, it's not unusual to say, for instance, his son might move to a different town. I know from my own wife's um, family, a uh, one member of the Breton family moved in the late 19th century from um, Newry to Oma and set up a new shop. 
Uh, and that's a kind of a typical thing. So it's very useful to have these small uh, directories. Most of these small places don't have individual annual directories, but you will pick them up in these general directories. Now I'm going to go into the Belfast directories. Uh, Belfast 1755. You've got to remember it's a small Presbyterian town. It was a small town really until the 1820s, 1830s, uh, but it becomes of manufacturing importance from, you could say, 1790 on. It's kind of bubbling away. Mary Delaney uh, from Mount Panther, and uh, she's just the long bridge there. You can see the, the things. Actually, it was bigger than it looks there, but this is from the Bally McCarrot side. So uh, there's very little building there. Joy's Paper Mills. Uh, the first printing press in Belfast was set up by James Blow in 17, 1696. Um, and the first newspaper, the Belfast Newsletter, came out in 1738. Uh, but strangely, there was no almanacs produced. There was newspapers and there was Bibles and religious works until the 1760s. And that's when you get Belfast and Ulster almanacs being produced. Paper was short, there was shortage of paper. Joy had started the uh, newsletter and instead of importing paper, they started producing their own paper. So this made it possible by the 1750s, 1760s to start printing local stuff. Here's a typical almanac. Um, they were avidly read by high and low in East Ulster till the 1850s when numbers fell and styles changed. So from the 1750s to the 1850s, you get particularly Ulster almanacs. This is a later Belfast almanac. I haven't got a, an image of the earlier ones. They're just gorgeous looking. And this is a guy called Tantra Barbus, a late 18th century Ulster peddler. Um, he would go around and peddle the stuff. Uh, there was the Belfast Almanac, McGee's Belfast Almanac, Belfast Predictions, the Belfast Prognostication, Belfast Town and Country Almanac, Sims and McIntyre's Northern Almanac, all these wonderful almanacs. And they were as popular with the Presbyterians and the Anglicans as with the Catholics. They all loved astrology. They all loved craziness. And um, there's nothing wrong with craziness. In February 1809, a cultivated reader of the Belfast magazine um, mentioned getting his latest Belfast almanac at the local shop in Cushendall, and I quote, as I generally do, being conscious of the utility of such publications. Because, of course, along with the craziness, there was all these kind of lists of public officers and institutions and colleges and all sorts of stuff, fantastic stuff that you can't get outside directories. These almanacs are all in the Linden Hall Library. They're hard to get. It'd be wonderful if they were digitized. There's a lot of stuff in them. Now, these are the other kind of little publications. This is, these were also printed in the almanacs. Little story about the wise little man and the wise little woman um, singing unto the Lord and the happy woman content dwells in her mind and stuff like that. Biblical stuff. Belfast was bubbling under at the time. It hadn't produced a directory, but it was really making strong links with the West Indies trade and with the cotton trade. Here's a lovely map of Belfast in 1791. You can see it's small, nothing happening really on the Ballybacarrot side, but those are plans. High Street, that's Kerry's version of the Nixon. Watercolor, it's a very nice little place. You can see it's bustling, it's not numbered. You can see the street signs hanging out. Here's a couple of the old street signs, shop signs, 1790s. The Book and Breaches and the Golden Saw, there's a whole load more of them, wonderful street signs. They continue to exist until the 1840s or 1850s, but Belfast was fully numbered by about 1800, 1802. 1805, uh, a nice painting of houses um, on that street. Now, the printers and publishers turned out reams of memorandum books, pocket books, portable tradesmen's guides, diaries and stationary ephemera, which helped shape the content of future directories. Now, it's worth calling the attention of researchers to a so-called directory of Belfast by 1740, which was assembled recently in the, 18, in the 1990s by J.W.R. Adams. He looked at newspapers and he made up his own directory. Dublin Corporation did the same thing for 1738 for Dublin City. Uh, they're kind of making up the uh, directories, which are very useful and interesting. Um, now, Adams uh, also produced a beautiful facsimile of the Smith directories. These were the first Belfast directories in 1807 or 1808. 
Holden, William Holden, who was doing a general directory for the British Isles, showed that Belfast had got onto the British and Irish commercial map by listing about 280 city merchants in his triennial directory in 1805. The stimulus now came mainly from the growth of cotton manufacture in Belfast since the 1780s, together with the spur of government, naval and military expenditure during the Napoleonic and Peninsular Wars. Uh, they were taking up government expenditure between 1807 and 1814 was the Peninsula War. And there was also high Irish domestic demand for cheap cotton clothing. From late 1805, Joseph Smith, who was a printer and almanac maker, had gathered materials for a serial directory. He wanted to do one every year. This was delayed till January 1807. And the 28 page Belfast directory was a simple alphabetical list of some 590 merchants, traders, etc., with classified lists of attorneys, barristers, clergy, physicians, surgeons, ships and ship owners, and captains. There was 46 names of those for the convenience of visiting businessmen. Again, it's for outsiders coming to Belfast. The list is almost completely numbered. Uh, it's more fully numbered than Holden's list in 1805, suggesting that the corporation was in a slow course of numbering houses in those years. On the model of the Treble Almanac in Dublin, it was bound together with the Belfast Almanac. So you got Smith's directory along with the Almanac. The list was expanded in 1808 to 928 persons of note, 795 traders. Now this is more than merely the elite in a town of 22,000 people resident in 3,500 houses. So you're looking at lists of householders essentially, and you're wondering how many are covered. I reckon about 26% of all the houses in Belfast are listed. There's a guide to public institutions that followed a classified list of professionals, along with notes on things as the stands and rates for sedan chairs. So if you wanted a sedan chair, you had to go to Donegal Square and you could see how much it cost. So again, outsiders. Although Holden in 1809, uh, managed another listing of 750 tradesmen for Belfast, besides short listings for outlying villages. Friction between Britain and America led to a downturn in the making of cotton and deepest depression, exacerbated from 1814 by severe competition with American factories. So there was no directory published for Belfast City until 1819, when textiles began to revive. That's why there's no directories for that period. Now, Holden maintained classified listings of certain key occupations in Belfast in a New Look directory in 1806, 16, 1817. But Joseph Smith, who was producing the directory, he went back to being a bookseller. And one of the things he also reprinted was an emigrant directory. It's amazing. You could actually get New York directories and American directories, buy them in Belfast before you went to America. So he reprinted in 1819 the Western Gazetteer or Emigrants Directory with directions to emigrants. And if you go on to archive.org, you'll find some wonderful early 18th century and 18th and early 19th century New York and Boston directories. They already have Irish people set up there. And we know that Ulster people and Irish people bought these directories in Ireland before they left so they could actually make connections. I've left out Newry. Newry also produced, Newry had produced the Almanacs early. It produced an, a directory for 1819. It was the only real rival to Belfast, although I believe there was a, a directory published in Derry in 1819, but I've never got sight of it. Now here's Bradshaw's directory. It was launched a 218 page general and commercial directory for 1819, also with a directory for Lisburn in March, 1819, inaugurating a work close to the best of contemporary norms. This is as good as you get anywhere and provided information crucial to the mechanics of the life of a commercial traveler, uh, able to board steam packets, which are coming from Belfast and Glasgow and Liverpool, also listed 2,700 Belfast persons in trades and professions at nearly every level of skill and means down to laborers, nailers and scrap iron mongers with another 740 guys in Lisburn and elsewhere. He detailed presiding members, officers and opening times in respect of the key urban boards, such as the Lidden Hall, um, 
savings bank, chamber of commerce, police office, dispensary, markets, schools and academics, academies, etc. And he gave schedules and rates of daily post and carriage and times of court session and times of court service, church service. He also classified the tradesmen by category. So you got alphabetical lists and then you got classified tradesmen, a list of those making soap, a list of those um, selling wholesaling cotton goods, stuff like that, made it easier for the commercial travellers. He also gave an outline history of Belfast, an urban timeline from 1612, and a guide to street location. There was very little the commercial visitor lacked in making his way through the commercial and legal network of the city. And he was able to use the whole thing to impress uh, citizens with their know-how. Here's Donegal Square, 1820s, looks very quiet, but this is where all the lawyers lived. So these are the addresses of the lawyers. This is where you get it. I know, so of course that. Now, there was nothing else happened during no more directories um, uh, appeared in the 1820s. Oh, I have to say as well, I reckon myself that about 40% of the population of householders in Belfast is included in Bradshaw's directory. It's quite a big percentage. It's close to half of all households. And you can fit them into a social and economic context to make better sense of their lives. On our own website, we did a typed out breakdown of occupations by street. So it's the first time you can get a street directory. We made it up retrospectively. Um, now there's a second one brought out in 1820 by Smith. He kind of copied Bradshaw and he came back to the directory and it surpassed Bradshaw's in the size of its listing of inhabitants of Belfast. But it didn't quite match the rival in complexity of structure. Uh, you get variant surnames in both listings. So it's worth comparing both sides to see uh, if you can't find somebody in 1819, you might find the same person with a different surname in 1820. Um, and then if you look at Piggott's commercial directory, the general directory for 1820-21, you get another big listing of people in Belfast for 1821. So you get 1819, 1820 and 1821. It's the best served period until the late 1830s, which is very important for genealogical inquiry because there's overlaps and people that aren't in one directory might be in another directory. And then there's the Hibernian directory by Piggott in 1824 and included about three and a half thousand professionals, merchants and nobility in classified and alphabetical order <clears throat> together with public officers for 1824. Now, here's a kind of a thing. You can see these things were, se were sent uh, where you get a guide to the Giants Causeway, you get tourist stuff, and increasingly the commercial agents were also accompanied by tourists. So the directories were used by tourists. You also get there's Edward Duffy, a bookseller in Enniskill, and advertising in, uh, in that area. You get these things, they're bought in Belfast and they bring them down to the local locality. Now, business uncertainty in Belfast, in spite of very slow economic consolidation, Belfast was increasing, but it was increasing slowly. So there was no more directory ventures for much of the 1820s and 1830s. This is a William Fraser picture of the old, um, uh, of a, a bridge actually um, where, uh, where the uh, Queen's Bridge is. You can see the glass works. Um, and it certainly gives an impression of industrial activity in the late 1820s. Robert Donaldson's relatively short 84-page uh, directory of Belfast, 1831-32, offered engravings, uh, it's a beautiful set of engravings. They're gorgeous, gorgeous woodcuts. Daniel Davis, who basically had a hardware shop, a fantastic hardware shop. I love hardware shops in North Street. A simple alphabetical list of about 590 merchants, traders, uh, and classified lists of attorneys, barristers, clergy, physicians, etc., and captains for the convenience of visiting businessmen. Here you can see the kind of listing. Uh, the list is more fully numbered than in 1805. Uh, so you can see that most things are numbered. You can see some, some places are still not numbered, but most houses are numbered. Um, oh, actually, hang on. Sorry, I've, I've skipped the wrong thing. <laughs> but I'm actually correct. You get a table of reciprocal distances, again, for commercial agents. They needed to know how far to different towns, if they could bring stuff there, sell stuff, order stuff, post stuff or send it in parcels with carriers. So that's a very, that's a big thing there. Um, uh, 
I reckon that about 25% of Belfast households are included in, in Donaldson's directory. So it's a good deal less than in 1820. Uh, it was nearly half in the, in the early 1820s. Um, now, the bookseller, Matir, brought out another one, and he regained ground with an alphabetical listing of about 5,400 merchants and traders in Belfast, and that's about 50% of households, together with about 500 substantial merchants in the hinterland of Belfast. This is an elegant 200-page volume. It has a shorter classified listing of the more affluent merchants and professionals. 1840s, this is when directories really begin to come into their own in Belfast. It really begins to build up steam. And perhaps the most attractive set of Belfast directories ever made was um, the NEAT series published by uh, Matthew Martin, accountant and state agent between 1839 and 1842. By the early 1840s, hotels and inns made much of home libraries of directories and handbooks in their commercial rooms. Every hotel had their own special library of almanacs, directories, and that sort of thing for commercial agents. Uh, the directory was now a staple item of office furniture in the business, public and professional realms. To answer some of the various and dissimilar purposes to which these texts were now applied, Martin adopted the most developed uh, directory format yet for the presentation of names and addresses. He had names first in alphabetical order, second classified by occupation, you can see that there, and also listing <clears throat> Uh, inhabitants and businesses by number and street. That's the first time you get true listings by street. So Martin's Belfast directory for 1839 was strictly speaking the first local street directory. The lists were compiled by personal visits timed for December each year when the mobile urban population was usually, as he said, settled for the winter. Already it's clear that there was a big distinction between, now I want to show you this because it's quite interesting, over the century, this is from 1839 to 1860, and it's a table of the breakdown of households by alphabetical order, street, on the street, and classified order. And there's the estimated number of houses in the city. Now, if you assume that there's one household per house, that's totally false, but you're going to, it's a very crude guide to the number of households. You can work out the proportion of households that are included in uh, each directory. Now, you can see very obviously until <clears throat> there was a big distinction between the number of, of households in alphabetical order and the number on the street. Uh, until 18, the 1850s, in Martins and other directories, crude estimates suggest that some 40 to 50 percent of city households were represented in the alphabetical order lists, while 20 to 30 percent were recognized in the street listings. It makes searching directories less problematic than later in the century when the balance was reversed. From the 1850s, everything changes. If you don't find somebody in the alphabetical order, there is a strong likelihood that they're actually not in the alphabetical order, they're on the street order. That's from the 1850s on. You can see from that table that the number of, of uh, people in the street order is much higher from the 1850s than in the uh, alphabetical order. So if it's not in the alphabetical list, it could be on the street list. That's much harder to search for. And that's why digitizing the directories is incredibly important. Um, those people in the classified lists on the third thing were generally the respectable, secure minority of merchants and tradesmen. And they rarely made, made up more than 25% of city households at any time in the 19th century. There's great residential transience, and it makes these directories of great genealogical value. In a city of 12 to 14,000 families in the 1840s, and five to 7,000 directories listings, that's heads of families, at least a fifth of family groups came and went each year. So the people in the, in, there's a big change of households every year. The respectable poor, but if you look at the number of people by the 1840s in the directories, Martin's directory, Henderson's directory, there's such a high proportion that that's when you begin to see the respectable poor. Up to that date, you only got the tradesmen and the merchants. You begin to see muslin weavers, uh, policemen, jobbing tailors, bakers, paviors, and not just the merchants. And it should be borne in mind that young single men and women migrating from the country, lodging in rooms and tenements, and getting by in factories year by year, this is the same thing broken down in proportions. So you can see the percentage of everything. And that'll give you a guide as to where to search for stuff. Now, um, 
there's constant migration. People coming up from the country, they're very poor, they live totally invisibly, and then they go on to Glasgow or Liverpool or London. So you have to, they're hardly ever captured. Now, it shouldn't be forgotten that the entertainment value of the Almanac was also not exhausted in this hard-headed era. They were not relegated to country fairs. They continued to offer small amounts of money to city hawkers. You can see there up in up on the top right-hand corner, uh, somebody in 1853, uh, a McCann, he lives by selling almanacs. This is a very poor person. He doesn't appear in the directories, but he sells almanacs. And you can see there, uh, <clears throat> uh, there's quite funny stuff where they were selling um, poor rabbins. Uh, um, it's interesting to see the poor robin almanac, which was a particular kind, sold in city bookshops, given a regional colouring in Ulster Scots. Poor Rabin's Almanac for the Town of Bill Faust by Billy McCart, Billy McCart, of the County Downside. So these were very popular. They would be bought by the educated. Now you get Henderson's. One of the new forces also <clears throat> uh, was the penny post office system introduced in 1840. It made postal communication very cheap and it encouraged people to um, advertise by post. Uh, and that made needing names and addresses of even quite poor people more important. That's another reason why the directories get bigger. Now, for the first time uh, since about 1819, 1820s, you get Belfast directories coming out in sequence. John Henderson of Castle, of Castle Place, the bookseller who advertised Poor Rabin's Almanac, among other things, had been eyeing this market for a couple of years. Like many speculative publishers of this kind, Henderson was a printer, a publisher, he sold ballads, a bookseller, stationer, and proprietor of a circulating library. He was beaten to punch to the punch by a post office um, directory in 1843, but he brought out beautiful directories in Belfast in 1843, 46, 50, and 52. They were excellent specimens of the older directory tradition. Here's an example. A neat volume, suitable for carrying in the pocket of a great coat, with a fold-out map, easy to consult, and pleasantly laid out at about 400 pages. It was not very different from the Martins directory in arrangement and clarity, although it increased the number of households listed, and Henderson anticipated extensive circulation among merchants, public offices, hotels, etc. The map didn't display any part of East Belfast, incidentally, in the 1840s, and listings themselves were confined to the city rather than the neighbourhood. Reviews praised the way it condensed, quote, a body of miscellaneous information on almost every point valuable to mercantile and commercial men. Now, the first edition of the mighty Belfast and Province of Ulster directory for 1852, for, uh, which both basically took over things in Belfast from 1852, that the first volume appeared in May 1852, with the usual unctuous introduction by the editor, James Alexander Henderson and a brand new map, quote, to facilitate the progress of strangers and others through the town. James Alexander Henderson had been running the thriving Belfast newsletter from 1845, having married into the McKay family, which had owned the newspaper from the 1790s. Also in 1752, the same newspaper published the first illustration in any Ulster paper, woodcuts of the Duke of Wellington's funeral. He was advancing very fast. It seems that from the later 1840s and early 1850s, when Belfast was thronged with cheap labour, taking refuge from the famine and poverty in West Ulster, it was a hinge point in the industrial development of the city. And it's likely that the Belfast newsletter had been thinking for several years about setting up a directory. Its resources were much greater than the modest bookselling enterprise of Henderson. I, I don't know whether there was any relation between John Henderson and the Henderson family of the newsletter. The format of the new uh, newsletter, I'm going to go through this now in a second, the format of the new directory mimicked that of Tom's directory, which had been coming out in Dublin since 1844, and already monopolised the market there. These opulent directories satisfied the appetite for data, listed, digested and tabulated, that was the mainstay of the Victorian popular non-fiction market. But it differed from Tom's directory in one way. Tom focused on the city of Dublin, supplemented with national listings, professions and office holders, and tables of county officers. The Belfast and Ulster, which I'll call it, uniquely made its, its, its business throughout the lifetime of the directory to encompass trade and administration in most or all of the towns and villages in Ulster. Here's a list of them in 1890. It had a hugely detailed thing. Martin and Henderson and other ones gave a few of them. This brought in everything. It just folded in everything into the area. 
Um, <clears throat> so it helped to a standard arrangement layout of names and addresses, street listing, alphabetical listing, um, and a classified listing. But it was evident, as I showed you before, that if you go to these directories, the Belfast directories, and you just look up somebody on an under alphabetical order, say, if you go to the prony shelves in the search room from 1900, you will only see what's in the alphabetical listing and there could be stuff in the street listing. That's something you always have to bear in mind. But luckily, Prony has digitized a lot of these. So most of them, some of them, not all of them. Uh, and so you have to bear that in mind, but you can catch them that way. Now, as the population of the city expanded, the size of the Belfast and Ulster grew inexorably from about 700 pages to 900 pages or more by the 1900. A greater proportion of the population was included on the pages than was conceivable in directories of the 1820s and 1830s. While there was about five or 6,000 households mentioned in the 1820s, the Belfast and Ulster was marshalling 25,000 names by the 1870s and 50,000 names by the 1880s. Now, I've already talked about the non-appearance of the transient poor in these directories. It's possible when you come to about 1852-53 to show this in more concrete terms. The Church of Ireland's central mission sponsored clergymen in the 1840s and 50s to visit and assist the poor in inner city Belfast. The detailed working diary of one of these clergymen, the Reverend Anthony McIntyre, has survived in respect of 1853 and 54. And I've listed about 73 persons who were all the heads of households named in the diary for February to March 1853. And I compared this data with listings in the Belfast and Ulster for 1852. Uh, there's a time lapse, but it's striking how long, uh, but when you look at the very poorest, it can be striking how long the very poorest remain almost invisibly in lodgings. One Charles Connor of 23 Hudson's Entry had lived for 24 years in a filthy hovel charging small rent. And he was never in any directory. The first thing to note Here's a guy, a sinful wretch, John Chambers. He doesn't appear in the directory. From Lisburn, he's a horse dealer, a cow jobber, uh, and McIntyre meets him. And there's a kind of a back street. The first thing is the Belfast and Ulster often doesn't mention, uh, it doesn't list everybody. You can see there, Johnston's Court, it just says 14 small houses. Joy's Entry, it just says 21 small houses. Boundary Court, eight small houses. That's a lot of households. And often they contain three or four households. Uh, of the 26 streets where I look in McIntyre's directory or diary, seven of them weren't even mentioned by the directory. So they weren't even mentioned. Um, that's Bammer's Court, Brady's Row, um, McGrady's Entry. Other minor streets, they only told you how many houses. And of 73 persons listed, I was able to locate 12 of them in the directory. That's 16% of the total. Most of these persons had been dealing or involved in trade in earlier years but had become poverty stricken by the early 1850s. One was widow Spence of Francis Street, who had spent 36 years in a small room, where at one time she kept a public house and groceries. One time she said she had plenty of money and goods, but she's very poor now. <clears throat> the directory listings can be deceptively clean and free of social context. And it's instructive to be able to visualize the sometimes terrifying squalor um, and helplessness uh, of people in these tiny courts and annexes. McIntyre lists members of an underclass, rarely but occasionally mentioned in directories at any time of year. Most of these persons are not missing from the directory due to transience, but rather to extreme immiseration. Nobody bothered taking their names. Here's an example, Jane Mitchell, naked, pale as death, seated on a stone in Johnston's court, engaged in sewing. On her knees sat the skeleton of a child, Disease had fallen on its lungs two years ago, recovering from measles, four other children standing around partially covered in rags. She's earning fourpence per day and just by sewing, pledging all her articles in pawn. She was down to her last petticoat. She came from Newton Ards, formerly a Presbyterian. This is also interesting because it shows that many of the big mill owners, if you didn't get a job in a mill, you, were, you got subcontracted work veining um, rags and veining linen and stuff. All these people were like outside subcontracted workers. They don't appear in the directory. Now, Belfast 1860. Um, <clears throat> here's a quick list. I mentioned that uh, I'm going to have to go fairly quickly now. Um, I mentioned that 
we have a, an inter we have most of the directories for the 19th century for Belfast. However, there are many others, or a number of others which aren't there. So bear this in mind. First of all, there's Adams, that was the retrospective directory. Then there's Holden, which is a general English directory. And then there's Smith, Piggott, general directory, Smith in 1820. And then you can see a post office directory in 1843, which I've never seen. Uh, Slater is a general directory, 846, 42. And then you get a number of, a number of Belfast and Ulsters, 1854 and 1856. Uh, Adair's 1860, Belfast and Ulsters, 1861. So it's worth checking that, another one in 1868, and Slater's in 1894. So you can fill in a lot of useful gaps. These are in the Central Library in Royal Avenue, and they're also in the Linden Hall Library. We might end up digitizing them eventually. Now, by the 1870s, the Belfast and Ulster had a practice of listing streets newly created in the Belsling city. Some terraces were absorbed into bigger streets. The directory came out every two or three years. Uh, and it took until the later 1890s before there was enough confidence to make the Belfast Directory an annual publication, although they had that ambition from the 1860s. Um, now, by 1887, in 1887, they experimented with the production of one volume dedicated entirely to the city of Belfast, but it wasn't popular. And it went back to the whole province of Ulster uh, um, from, from uh, 1880, 1890 and on. <clears throat> uh, making a directory was, a, was an arduous process. The office couldn't afford to be slack or the reputation of the directory would suffer and sales fall rapidly. By 1900, the directories included listings of limited liability com companies from the city and also obituaries. Its remit expanded as a municipal area increased in 1898. Uh, in 1903, it said that the alphabetical directory contained the names of every householder in Greater Belfast, which is kind of hard to believe, but it was a name. At that stage, there was very little reluctance among householders to name their occupations or to object to these being printed. You just ask somebody what you worked at and you put it down in the directory. By 1910, the Belfast and Ulster had expanded to 1,800 closely printed pages. It was far from being the handy pocketbook sold as directories in the 1830s. Um, there was a list of doctors, streets were categorized under ward and parliamentary division. It didn't shrink during the First World War, it stayed the same size. The only time it ever failed to come out from the 1890s was in 1921, due to the chaos of the War of Independence. They brought out a, a dual volume in 1921-22. From 1923 on, it continued to be called the Ulster Directory, but it didn't include listings for the um, counties which were in the Republic, in the free, Irish Free State at that stage. It, it only took in Northern Ireland. It began to include just the civil service in Northern Ireland from the mid 1920s. Right up into the 1960s, it was 1900 or 2000 pages. It continued to be printed during the Second World War, although it was censored. Um, although most directories around England and Wales didn't come out uh, during the Second World War. It struggled in the early 1970s as during the Troubles, um, when people proved reluctant to visit homes and also people became reluctant and withdrawn and suspicious and they wouldn't give information. It became something of a totemic white elephant by the early 1990s when the decision was taken to stop publication. The directory was set aside like the rusting behemoths of Victorian industrial technology with the caveat that they now offer genealogists and researchers extraordinary riches. Now I'm going to just go through, here you got your late industrial Belfast, 1887, commercial agent in 1890, brickworks 1890, a classic Belfast and Ulster directory in 1890. Um, it is much more tightly printed. The ads aren't half as nice as the early ads. They're not engravings anymore. You get a nice listing there of all the directories in town and country between 1820 and 1896. Not very many really. So you have to go to the Ulster directory to get a lot of towns and villages. This is, well, this is a gimmick that was produced uh, for the first Fermanagh County directory. This is one of the classic Bassett's directories in the 1880s. And it, it, they, it's a beautiful directory. Just as an aside, and obviously I'm not going into this, you get Tom's directory from 1844. And it's a vital directory to give you the general information for the, the Ireland as a whole. And then you get professional directories like the first Catholic directory. 
1843, and then doctors, medical directories, also from 1843. Here's the key Dublin professional directories, Church of Ireland directories, Lees, Arabies, Irks, Post Office Directory from 1832 to 46, Batteries, Battersby's Catholic Directory, 1836, Clergyman's Almanac, 1842, Complete Catholic Directory, Medical Directory, 1843, Tom's Directory, Shaw's Pictorial Directory, and then a series of medical directories from 1873. Where can you find them? Public at Record Office website, Belfast Central Library, Royal Avenue, Linen Hall Library, National Library, Dublin City Library, Ask About Ireland, Leicester University website for English directories, National Library of Scotland for Scottish directories, Guildhall Library, Falter Road and Linen and Wiley. And that's all. I'll have to move you on now to the guide to what we've got on our website. And that's Brilliant. Thank, thank you very much, Des. We'll get that playing now. Um, hi, okay, this is um, a little section where I'm going to show you how to use the uh, digitized street directories on the Prony website. The first thing I'll do, and I've shown you this already, is to show you a table of the uh, directories relating to Belfast um, in the 19th century, uh, which uh, some of which are digitized and some of which aren't. So you can see here fairly clearly, the, the, the directories in red are general directories in which Belfast appears, and the other directories are um, specifically um, uh, focused on uh, Belfast, so, as well as Ulster. So uh, here's all these for the first part of the 19th century, and here's the ones for the second part of the 19th century. You'll see there's various ones that aren't digitized. Then at the, on the other side, on the right-hand side of this are the uh, local directories for Ulster, one of which we have digitized on the Prony website. That's Londonderry, 1839. So now I'm going to go onto the um, Prony website and I'll show you how to use the directories. It's pretty straightforward. Go onto the page of the Prony website, go to search archives online, Go to street directories, <clears throat> search street directories, search again, always do it twice. <clears throat> now you'll get this. Uh, just briefly, just to show you, if you click on this cursor here, you'll see these are all the directories um, that we have digitized. So from 1819 to 1900. But you'll have seen from the table that there's a number of directories from the 1850s, for instance, that aren't included. So um, these can be directories can be got in the in hard copy, not in Prony, but in the Belfast Central Library or the Lynn Hall Library. OK, the first thing you can do is just search for names. Um, this will just I'm going to go you, the the directories were digitized and the text was uh, processed using optical character recognition. So it will pick up all the words um, uh, depending on the particular match function that you use. So I'm going to use the function any initially and search. And uh, it produces 4,438 4, results from Michael Gallagher. I'll click on the first one just to show you what has happened. And you'll see that this has picked up both Michael's and also Gallagher's. Uh, so that's of some value, but not the easiest thing. And I'm going to go back to results again. Michael Gallagher, all. And that produces 568 results for Michael Gallagher. And uh, it still produces the odd Michael, but it's essentially Gallagher's. And now exact. And this produces 11 exact results from Michael Gallagher. And these are purely, as you can see there, Michael Gallagher, but it also has the odd Michael. So th there are some odd bits of behavior in it, but it's nearly all the Gallagher's. Now, if you want to pick a Gallagher 
That's the spelling, G-A-L-L-A-G-H-E-R. But if you want to pick other Gallagher uh, variations, you have to enter each variation separately. There, there's no quick way to do this. So I'm going to show you L-L-A-H-E-R. And I'm going to pick all. And that'll give me 90 results for G-A-L-L-A-H-E-R, Gallagher. And you can see there, these are all the Gallaghers in the digitized uh, Belfast and Ulster directories for 1819 to 1900. Um, so it'll produce 90 results, but you can vary it using any and exact, and you'll pick up more results. Um, now, just to show you, whenever you do, say I'm going to go into this, you can, uh, at the bottom of each page, if you want to print it out, you've got the option to print, download the image or download the PDF uh, transcript. So if you want to print the page that you've picked out, this is the way to do it, um, rather than doing a screenshot. Now I'm going to go back here. Um, just to show you as well, and to prove the fact that it's, um, just OCR that's used. I'm going to put in the the name Cooper, <clears throat> and I'll do all. And um, the first one there uh, for Bradshaw's 1819, it it picks up the um, the trade Cooper uh, as well as the um, name Cooper. So that'll do something else. So just be aware of that. You can see here, if you hover the um, cursor over the page, uh, the image on the screen, it will magnify it. So that'll make it a little bit easier. So now I'm going to go back to results search. And in fact, I'm going to go back out of it. Um, I'm going to... hide floating controls. I'm going to go out of it and back in this way. And I'm going to just pick a particular, if you want to go through page by page on a particular directory, I'm going to pick Martin's 1839. Well, no, actually I'll pick Martin's 1841. And I'm going to go to there. And on the right hand side, you can see, uh, you can get the very first page and you can go from image to image. It's not a PDF, um, an entire PDF of the of the book, but you can go from image from page to page. They're all separate images, and you can get a pretty good idea. It's it's very fast, and you'll be able to browse the entire directory that way. So it's very useful. Now I'm going to go out of it again to avoid a little glitch that sometimes takes place. Um, I'll go back to Martin's 1841 and search. And now on the left, I've gone through, I've shown you how to go through the, the directory page by page. Now this shows you, this will filter the directory according to the thematic structure of the directory. You can see there, there's uh, under section, you can see there's the alphabetical directory, the street directory, country residence, provincial directory. And then under locale, it will tell you where there are particular, um, there's a list of merchants and tradesmen in particular towns. Uh, I'm going to just pick the alphabetical directory just for the sake of it. This will get you their alphabetical list and it'll get you the start of the alphabetical directory and you can go page by page through it from there on. So that gets you directly into the alphabetical directory. Um, and I'm going to go to uh, locale and I'm going to pick Armagh. And this will pick out the Armagh, section Armagh. I'm going to go straight to there. And this shows you the um, breakdown of a uh, selection of merchants, manufacturers and traders in Armagh in 1841. And you can go image to image. It's, a, it's very well done for Armagh, actually. Um, so these are the key functions and facilities that you have um, in the street directory. Um, digitized street directories on Prony. So I hope that's useful. Thanks.